people still afraid even though it's salty Need to see you moving around the bed, know you happy Need to see you happy if I'm not the one driving I'm so mature, I'm so mature I'm so mature, they got me in there Just to tell me there's a limit I don't want none, I just want to know And I can't have you, no one should Okay, what's up, everybody? It's Keyshawn Blackson here with another Play It Again by Play episode two. We got special guest Jamal Marshall, counselor from Listen Then Speak. Jamal, brother, thank you for being with us today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Let the world know who you are. Let's jump into this, man. Like, I know you're a gem dropper, so let's get in it. We get into this right off the bat. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> Keyshawn, thanks for having me on, man. Um, man, if, I'm, if this is my introduction to the world through you, uh, I want to let them know that in the mental health industry, our industry is saturated, saturated. And so one reason I'm here is to actually break up the noise and get people results. Um, I didn't come out the womb wanting to be a counselor, um, a consultant <laughs> and a public speaker. That was just a call that was placed on my life that I felt the need to answer. Uh, I initially wanted to be a fireman, <laughs> but God had a different plan for me. So to tell your audience a little bit about me, uh, I believe that what you do should always be attached to your why, which is attached to a part of who you are. And I came from a very abusive childhood. Uh, I grew up in a lot of fear. Uh, I had one parent that was absolutely divine and another was mean enough to be Satan themselves. Uh, my dad, unfortunately, in his early days was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And so I did not hope, know how to predict him, couldn't put my finger on him, didn't know how to be around him. And so growing up like that produced a lot of insecurity in me and a huge fear of rejection enveloped. And so everything was perfect. Everything was excellent because that was my way to not be rejected. Those are the, the signals that my brain received was this is your path out. This is your path to safety. And I carried that outside the home of being right, being perfect, being excellent, being a straight A student being overachiever in everything and it wore me out and then it also led to you know stuffing things down suppressing things emotionally it led to addictions I mean it just I went down so many dark alleys that I never envisioned and the strange thing is is when I first started I'm dating myself uh, in college back in 20 2003 yikes um I went for computer graphics because it looked lucrative I hated the schedule all the classes were like three and a half hours apart. So I was like, okay, forget this. I'm going to do general education. And it was in the midst of doing that, that, or I was 18 at this time, a series of questions would come to me. People would say like, do you, are you a counselor? And I just, it was weird. I had a lot of friends that were older than me. All of my friends were twice and sometimes three times my age. And they would come to me with their issues. And somehow I would just listen to them and find practical and pragmatic solutions to their problems. And I, I would hear this for about the better part of a year and a half, and I never caught on to, you know, what they were asking. Because um, I had a government job. I was working at the Department of Justice. Um, it didn't really ring a bell with me. And then at my second year, close to getting my associates, I decided to declare my major as psychology. So let's fast forward. Uh, four years later, I transitioned to, to university. Um, and I gotten my degree but I sensed the need that I needed help before helping others. You know, I, I was a, I graduated with 3.81. Um, I had gotten outstanding on every performance appraisal, but I had so much darkness inside of me. Um, so much addiction, so much isolation in so many ways. Like outwardly, I look like the star player. Everybody like just loved Jamal. But inwardly, I hated myself and I hated my dad. I hated my life um, and I knew that I needed to get help before helping anyone else so it was around 2009 um, where something happened it's, it's funny that I, I ended up working in HR <laughs> later in my life but in HR my paperwork didn't go through to advance me to the next level so I got the highest grade I could get where I was in the government and next you go for a co-op to you know kind of groom you to become you know a uh, full-time person that can travel and do different things with DOJ and the paperwork didn't go through so they had to the position pretty much was dissolved by that point because I had got, gotten as high as I could go and so I literally had to leave the government and like everybody was like I can't believe they're not keeping you Jamal you've been like one of the most I was the only black dude on the director's floor um 
And it was weird at the time. I didn't understand it, but I wasn't upset. I saw it as an open door for me to actually get the help I needed. And so I literally went away for 13 months <laughs> and invested in inpatient counseling. I invested thousands of dollars and thousands of hours in like healing spiritually, emotionally, just in my mind, even physically. And then through that time, um, even a little bit before then, my dad's life had gotten transformed. Um, you know, I'm a person of faith. And um, through us sitting together on the floor, he was drunk as ever. He told me a lot about his childhood and it endeared him to me. And I said, hey, dad, can you just go to church with us tomorrow? Um, and at this time, it's not like I was living the, a right life myself. I just thought that was a good place for him to go and process all this stuff. And um, he gave his life to God, <laughs> he gave his life to Christ. And I was amazed because I never thought this guy, this my dad was for the streets. <laughs> I never thought James Robert Marshall would ever change from what he was to what he became. And so I watched him transform, but it's still a lot I had inside of me against him. I had my own, you know, alcohol, drugs and stuff like that and, and my own addictions. And I, I kept saying, I do this because you, the way I grew up around you. And I didn't realize that, that there was human responsibility on my part and trauma there. And so going through seven months of counseling initially healed a lot of those wounds. And I got to actually sit with him and talk with him and just share so much and be vulnerable with him. And I remember him telling me like, man, I can't judge you. That's, that's God's job. And just receiving love from my father that I never thought I would just change and transform something. It put a confidence in me. And then I went back and did an internship for an additional six months. And so it was through that time where they started training me because I worked in administration. It was so boring. <laughs> I did website quality control and they started tra training me for uh, counseling. So I took training in the clinical, you know, training in, in the practicum and all that stuff like that. In 2013, that's when I became a counselor. And I realized, especially in all of my early caseload, they all had issues with their father or a parent. And I was like, oh, so I got to see that everything that I had gone through in those first 22 years, which was hell on earth, was purposeful. You know, I tell each of my clients, your your misery becomes your ministry. And and even for people who are like, I'm, I'm not into all that religious stuff. Ministry simply means service. So the very dark <laughs> pits and alleys you go down and the very deep pits that you would never have signed up for become the very mountaintops and platforms that you serve others through. Because if it's not attached to who you were, then what, what are you there for? Um, right. And so just to introduce this, this is my long winded introduction to your audience. Um, I never thought out of all the darkness, all the insecurity uh, that I came from, that I would be uh, someone who is helping other people today, um, helping people who have really look at their story and they say, I wouldn't have written it that way. I was like, well, let's rewrite that story. But it's because I've been there. You know, yes, I'm trained. Yes, I'm certified. But it also is a part of who I am. Uh, so um, that's the first part of, of my story. Um, yeah. No, it's it's great to, you know, just hear that insight. I mean, the world, I'm pretty sure, appreciates you, you know, just opening that up, you know, cracking the egg open just like that. I mean, for one, this is like for us, you know, we want it to be real and organic and open. And just from hearing that little splurge of just cracking that egg open, I mean, I'm like, all right, let's scramble some eggs now. Um, so I want to I want to dive into next, like you you've been through, you know, this, like I said, it's open platform, you've been through some shit. Okay. And, you know, obviously, the things that you went through, um, shaped you to who you are today. Let's pinpoint stigma and awareness. Um, you know, what are some of the coping mechanisms that got you through those dark times? I don't think they were good coping mechanisms. There were some negative ones. I mean, for me, I think because watching what dad like went through, uh, I, I I didn't want any type of drugs or alcohol to stick. I drank, I smoked, but I was like, if that thing is in the jeans, man, I don't know if I want it. So I kind of was right. very careful about my consumption of any, any type of smoking, any type of black and miles, any type of whatever, any type of alcoholic beverage. I was like, yeah, let's, let's be careful with this. You know, so obviously I was promiscuous. That was a outlet of, you know, wanting some affection, wanting some love. Uh, and then when I decided to really lean into my faith, you know, I said, OK, we shouldn't be doing that anymore because outwardly that doesn't look too good. So I said, OK, well, we'll just go with pornography. That seems like the operative thing to do, which is just 
it's almost as strong, if not stronger than crack cocaine, at least the way dopamine feeds your mind. Uh, and so that ended up being a, a huge addiction that ripped my mind raw. And so I had to learn um, that these are, you have very valid emotional needs that you're meeting or legitimate emotional needs that you're meeting illegitimately. So what is a way to meet that need? My faith was a huge part of it. You know, prayer and meditation, journaling, also exercise. You know, I had to retrain at for for years. I've been coding my brain to cope in the wrong way. Um, and I forgot to mention to your audience, um, emotional eating was a huge one. And because of my smaller frame, I could hide it. People like, you know, people may see a person who's large or has a glandular issue and say, oh, they need this top. I could hide it. But I was eating everything in sight. You know, it's like, I'm not just going to have one burger. I may have three because it, I felt, especially from the childhood, so out of control that when I had a plate full of food, I just felt in control. But I was destroying, like you said, before we got on here, we only have one body. I was literally destroying my mind and my body. And so I had to find out a way spiritually, emotionally, socially, psychologically to recode the, the pattern that I had been in um, and, and learning that. You know, and then putting my own nuances because everything's nuanced to who we are as individuals. That's where the healing began to take place. And then also, what did I affirm? What did I believe about me? You know, anytime there's a need, it's just like, what is the lie that I'm believing about me? And then what's the truth to counteract that lie right. and to bring me into balance so that I move forward? So, I mean, this brings me, you know, to the point where you, I know at one point you mentioned through our previous conversation root cause um you know a, lo a lot of people kind of neglect that word you know you know they don't want to embrace it they kind of just want to embrace the moment that they're in but what role does root cause play in mental health i mean yeah this is supposed to be a business conversation but i think going back to the word root cause i mean everything that we do as human beings evolves around our state of being in the moment that we're at so um many people would say that it's cultural background you know how we're raised the morals and ethics that we come from but you know households that aren't aware of that and they just do out of spite because you know that's just what they feel is right um how can we ample and tackle you know some of those arenas to just bring awareness to that because i we don't have enough awareness for that message these days right i want to go back to something you said that this is a business conversation i mean I, I work with coaches consultants and service providers and even people in the career field who are six-figure earners they're all in business <laughs> but they all have a headspace so that's the the very industry agnostic part about what i do so we're doing business because if you think about all the suicide notes that we see and all the people who have self-deleted they were great business people that never dealt with the root causes and so root causes are extremely important because many of us based on the frame of reference and our background we show up on autopilot and we stay in these toxic cycles and patterns over and over again until we disrupt them but we don't disrupt them when we don't know why we're doing this it's like what's the why behind the what why is this happening where where is the pain point that we need to actually go to and so for me you know i, I got to see the root cause was fear of rejection it was a huge one for me mm. this is why i could show up on a job and be the first one to get there and the last one to leave and while outwardly that looked really excellent to a manager it connoted poor time management on my on my behalf because i was doing my job and other people's job <laughs> you know because I, right. I would let people punt projects to me that had nothing to do with my kpis um, why are you doing that, Jamal? What, are you afraid that someone will tell you no? Are you afraid to, to lose your job? Fear was the motivator, you know? So it, it started from, which is a scarcity mindset and a fixed mindset. An abundance mindset and a growth mindset says I take risks, but it also says I know my boundaries and I establish them. And when I say no, I mean it. And this no gives me a greater place to say yes to. Easy to say that right now in the moment, but when you don't understand the root cause of why you show up the way you do every day, you'll continue to show up that way. I tell each of my clients, mm -hmm. a pattern remains a pattern until you disrupt it. But you got to know how and why you're disrupting it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that a million percent. Um, people around us, you know, they say, you know, a lot of people strive for perfection. I mean, just you can look around just simply opening up your phone. You go to Instagram, you got people comparing their lives to one another like you know, they, they think that, you know, 
having a yacht sailing across the seas on a private jet that's what they have to have in life instead of embracing the you know things that they have in the moment which causes them to act out of spite and become something that they're not um which plays like i said it goes back to mental health it plays a big toll into their mental health um it's only getting worse i mean from what i've been seeing and it's not being addressed but i wanted to address it given that you're you're in that space where you deal with people in business and you deal with people in general um why and how i'm gonna start with the why why do you think this generation of creatives and business people have this itch to um compare their lives and go after what is for me i i believe it's it's obsolete and not existent because it's not part of their nature it's like a doctor trying to be a lawyer but the doctor's like oh i want that lawyer's lifestyle you know because you know that that's just what i see that fascinates me but why do people have that headspace like what is that tick that's creating that up spike and people just wearing now a mask you know to compare their lives to the next person and how can we you know what are some ways that you think we can fix it Keyshawn, that's a great question, and I'm going to give you a very practical and pragmatic answer. Um, we live under a blitzkrieg of information. That's a German word. That means we are under a wave. This is the age of information. And, and with the advent, I don't want to say the advent because it's been around since the 60s, but now that it's out in the open with the advent of AI, information is coming at us left and right. We don't know if it's real or fake. And so when we expect when there's been this great expose to our own brains, we don't often understand the way that we process Intel because we haven't developed trigger awareness. <laughs> and so why is this happening? It's because we're taking in so much and aren't even sure how to process the Intel in a way that's redemptive. And so a lot of times we process it in a way that's destructive. This is, I have to become that thing that I'm seeing, but that image that you're seeing, that post that whatever is hyper curated to play on your insecurities and to play on your fears. And so when we don't pause, as you know, I said a, a, a phrase that I've coined and trademarked, the problem is in the pattern, but the power is in the pause. When you don't pause, you will not be on purpose. You will be on autopilot and you will right. become the architect of your own destruction. Absolutely, I agree. Now, with that being said, social media, just like going back to the word addictions, is becoming a form of addiction. It's becoming a drug, if not bigger than any drug ever been created. Um, and if there's no breakage in the cycle, because now we're molding businesses and companies to adapt to the world of social media. So that's like saying, hey, you know, this is the drug that works for you take it but everybody now has to have it because that's our form of quote unquote marketing um but we're losing people in terms of you know now it's coming down to attention span you know people don't look at a post no longer than 10 to 15 seconds before they continue scrolling or hitting the like button what are what are the ways that you see um that we could probably break that cycle in a way. I mean, yeah, you know, this is this is a both business and mental question. So like the way we could break the cycle, how would you see that happening? And alternatively, you know, mentally, what can we do to create a safe space for business to market themselves without having to have such a social presence? Because I've seen companies spend thousands and hundreds of dollars on marketing campaigns and it flops and then now they're like oh it didn't work out like nike did it didn't work out like you know oreo did why and you know it's like, like it goes back to that comparison factor it, and it's on a scope of business now so like i'm saying like the the root cause is people comparing their lives to other people but now you got businesses comparing themselves to other businesses there has to be a break in that cycle for us to for one create a safe space for people to organically live up to their identity uh, without having to, you know, live in that stigma of, you know, comparison. What are some of the ways you, you would say you can see that happening uh, near future, 10, 15 years? Well, I'll answer the second half of the question you asked for the first time uh, and, and answer it now. I call it the digital detox. Um, dopamine detox sounds really good, but actual good dopamine is a good thing um but if being committed to the digital detox you don't 
understand how much you don't need something until you actually step back from it. So when you pause and say, you know what, let me for, for three days, and I would actually start with a day because that's biting off a lot. Just cut the phone off, airplane mode. Let me find a series of activities that I can do without having to use my phone. Let me put the phone on emergency mode. So if like someone in my family or a close friend needs to reach me, they can reach through to me if something happens that, I'm, that I need to be aware of. Other than that, I'm, I'm not getting on it. It actually gives the brain and the prefrontal cortex messages that, wait a minute, there is change going on. And the brain will begin to recode. You know, if the thing is, is that we never come off of because we never come off of it. We don't give our brains that opportunity to actually adjust. And so um, I actually did a post. The funny thing is a while ago about all the, the misdiagnoses that are happening in my own field. Everyone moving is claiming to be neurodivergent. No, I'm not saying there aren't subsidiaries. There are about, what, eight to ten subsidiary, subsidiaries of the neurodiversity. However, most people aren't. It's like, no, you just need to get off TikTok and YouTube shorts. You just for the last two years, since we've all kind of come more digital, your brain is wired for a short attention span. It's not that you are so much ADHD. You just need to actually take a break with your brain. Right. You know, and, and so I say all that to take the digital detox seriously when it comes to company from a business standpoint honestly having strategic partnerships cannot be ignored and for me in business i'm saying this to your audience that is one thing where that's how listen and speak has been able to scale and will continue to scale and continue to become a global brand because i'm not here to post every day to just get a bunch of likes you think about my industry the lurkers are the ones that hire me anyway because it's mental health right. you know <laughs> uh and when it comes to a company that wants to bring me on as a consultant that's a little bit different because you don't have to be as discreet but we're not monetizing by just a bunch of likes we're actually monetizing by partnering people to do amazing work and so if you think you have to have this online presence and yet there's somebody in your DMs who is a multimillionaire that can't wait to work with you. And you overlook that because you're so focused on your post. Guess what? That ship may have sailed and that's a missed opportunity. The one thing about Nakisha, and I know I'm preaching to the choir with you. When you deal with people who are multimillionaires and near the billionaire mark, they work very fast. They do things different and they do a lot right. of stuff behind the scenes. They're not very externally facing. And so right. for small companies or even large companies that that buy into this lie that you have to be super externally facing and you have to be doing what Apple and Nike is doing. It took them years to build up to that point to get into the minds of people that you need our product. So also doing market research, test the product first. Sometimes people don't want something because you've assumed. That's a lot of, we'll go back to listen and speak as a counselor and as a consultant and a public speaker, I can't assume I know what the audience wants. I have to actually do some research to find out what do they need and then speak to the need thereof. And right. so to answer your question practically, if we want to kind of one, two, three this, because people love steps, do a digital detox. Get the heck off your phone and off your computer for at least a day. Try to extend it to three days. Get out in nature. Vitamin D produ produces natural spikes of dopamine that your body needs. And also exercise. I know we, you and I have been talking a lot about that ad nauseum. Yeah. And then three, if you're in business, because this is a business podcast, Learn the, the focus and the strength and the wisdom of strategic partnerships because that's where your referrals come in. And these are the people that grow with you. And the, this is really depending on the, the model of your business. That's where the revenue is. Likes don't pay bills. Convince right. potential clients do. <laughs> <laughs> Facts on that. I think you're, dude, I mean, you nailed it spot on. Um, I, I couldn't have said it better. I, I couldn't have agreed more. I mean, last last question to you before we wrap up here you know how do businesses identify strategic partnerships you know people want to know that world they don't understand it they think it's just an illusion of you know a hopeful partnership of a company but what are some of those key points and ways that a person or a business can identify strategic partnerships good question Keyshawn. i want to be specific but i also want to be nuanced because I know you and I both know in our world, things can be a little black and white in a way that's not helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And I will say for those under the sound of my voice, it will depend on your industry. Um, for me, because I'm, I'm a certified counselor and I understand human behavior really well, I can be a little industry agnostic 
um not too you know you you want to kind of avatar whatever that client or client base looks like but also you don't want to shut yourself off to that people talk about ideal client and that is bs you will you will suffer when you focus on just one ideal client like i just helped this one person it's like really right um so i would say think about your industry and then connect with people who have who are either in that industry or have businesses synonymous with that industry and so with like with my industry most people who are business coaches they partner with me because they're like the person who i'm coaching they, they they're not getting it they need to actually work with you first before they even work with me they need to actually get their mind right because they're not going to apply what i'm giving them because they're too scared they have right. the potential to, to be a six-figure earner but they can't get out of their own way so jamal here take it <laughs> you know <laughs> and then when it comes to a person who's a six-figure earner you know who's already in their career space who's wanting to build a side gig they come to me because they need to actually manage, you know, I, I call it taking the NT off management. They need to manage themselves in the midst right. of everything coming at them. They got the board coming at them. They got their own manager. They got their direct reports. How do I manage me in the midst of this? How do I manage my own headspace? And when it comes to consulting, the, the way I build that out is they are when I usually when I have someone on my podcast, they say, you understand human behavior really well. Can you come into an organization and actually transform the way our teams do work? Because anybody can be say, I'm a consultant and come in and check off a box. I want to actually see the right. organization win. And so to your audience, I want to say, know your brand, know what you do. And then when people start, you'll, you'll find even through social media, people will start to, to come around, you know, when you get very specific take advantage of those opportunities think how can i partner with this person and develop questions to ask them that actually pulls that out of them now me as a counselor it's part of my profession to ask questions that pulls <laughs> pulls things out of people so it's a little right. bit maybe a little bit easier for me but i want to encourage everyone listening don't deny the power of listening not to respond but to understand understand your audience understand the persons in front of you and know who you can develop a strategic partnership with because you're not meant to partner with everybody some partnerships you'll wish like legally like i wish i would have never done this you'll you'll kind of get the vibe like okay this person is just meant to be someone who follows my content i like their stuff they like mine's maybe and then this one is someone i'm meant to partner with to actually build and grow with and it take your time don't go into anything anything without one setting up legal paperwork setting up a service agreement discerning the framework of that paperwork and if you don't understand like the legal stuff that you're getting hand it to someone who may look at it pro bono for you if you don't have the money or if you have a lawyer have your lawyer look at it i'm getting practical tips now <laughs> these are just this is what it talks about when you develop in a strategic partnership because you're legally bound to what you sign don't right. rush into it you know and for me uh, if anybody or, or in your audience is faith-based yes i pray about it <laughs> like god am i supposed to do this or not and if I'm not, you know, I let a person know, like, bro, this, this ain't going to work out because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Kofi, one of the books I, I counsel and coach through is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of my favorite quotes by him is begin with the end in mind. And there's so much, only so much you can see when you're in business, when you're taking risk, when you're out here, like building out systems and processes. But some stuff comes to you and your gut will tell you some stuff about an individual or a company. Listen to your gut. <laughs> right. Yeah, people don't trust their gut a lot nowadays and they just act on impulse, which, you know, impulse can be, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's like a 50-50 gamble, you know, but if you actually feel it in your gut, it, it definitely, it's a it's a calling. Like for me, there's been a lot of mitigated risks that I vetted out and it's just like gut intuition that I go off of. And, you know, many people would ask like, how are you able to take those risks without, you know, feeling like the fear factor? And I'm like, the fear factor goes away when you have mitigated it, but you feel it intuitively that it's the right decision that you're making. So core context for me. Yeah, brother, I agree 100%. Um, Jamal, thank you again, my guy, for being here. I know you're, you're a busy man and you do a lot for the world, but I really do appreciate you for being here. Um, is there any closing remarks you want to leave the world with before we wrap out of here? If the world is listening to this podcast, uh, I would say each one of us will have an expiration date. Um, and in the midst of building your business, build up you. 
I was uh, in a session with a client yesterday and I said, your business will grow to the degree that you do. And the reason why you're getting results in your business right now is because you're growing. Um, any political person can jump on a stage and talk about change. That's actually pretty dumb if you ask me. I'm gonna say that very crassly. Change is inevitable. Growth is a choice. We have to choose to grow. And as you're choos choosing to grow, don't neglect your mental, physical, and spiritual wellness. And don't think when, and don't do do it cheap. I can tell you, everyone who, who are my clients, <laughs> they say, I tried better help. You took the cheap route and you got what you paid for. And then I came right. to Jamal and got results. <laughs> um, and you, your mind is a control tower to the body. Invest in your headspace. You will not regret it. And ultimately, uh, to mitigate burnout, there are seasons of sowing and reaping, but do what you can. Don't bite off more than you can chew. If your body is sending you a signal that you need rest, obey it. Listen to your body. Absolutely. All right, brother. Jamal, again, thank you for being here. Everybody, this is a Play It Again by Play podcast episode two. We are over and out. Until next time, have a great one, everybody.